Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us on Think Cities Earth Day webinar. Hope you're having a great afternoon. Um, and you know, we've been we are celebrating 50 years since Earth Day was launched. So I hope that you've all done something meaningful to mark the occasion. I mean, some of you may have made pledges to reduce waste, walk more, eat less meat, or maybe planted a tree. Um, and if you can't do any of the above, I do implore you to watch Greta Thunberg's video called Our House is on Fire. My name is Lee Jiaping and I'm, I'm your moderator today. So sit back, relax, grab your cup of tea or coffee and stay with us um, for the next one hour. Today's topic is home gardening for food security. Um, in these times of lockdown, what better way to help the planet than to start planting your own food? Um, even if it's just on your balcony um, and if you don't have a garden. So, you know, a little pot here and there goes a long way. Um, so, uh, so do stay until the end because we've got a special surprise. And because it's 50 years of Earth Day, we have uh, 50 giveaways that are being offered to you first. And the download code will be uh, given um, shortly before we end today. So um, we've got you know, great speakers. Uh, we've got Shaolin Lao from Eats, Shoots and Roots and Harbour Gill from Ground Control. They are at the vanguard of the home gardening movement in Malaysia. And we're really fortunate to have them amongst our close friends um, at Think City. So the first to go on um, will be Shaolin and then she'll be followed by Harbour. So without um, further ado, I'd like to introduce Shaolin. Um, you know, Think City and Shaolin have had an amazing collaborative relationship for the last five to six years, coming on six years now. And Shaolin Lo is the design director and co-founder of Eat Shoots and Roots. She has been in the design industry for over 14 years, working on a range of corporate, educational and government based projects. Um, a few years after completing her MA in graphic design from the University of Creative Arts UK, uh, she discovered permaculture, um, the permaculture site called Umbun Pagi, and was awestruck by how little she knew about cultivating her own food, and by our high level of dependency on others for basic necessities. Um, because of that, she then co-founded Eats, Shoots and Roots in 2012, um, with the aim of empowering people with the skills and tools to grow their own food. Since then, Eat Shoots and Roots have um, designed and built 46 plus edible gardens, organized 100 over edible garden workshops, and um, also, you know, helped educate people about their nature and their relationship through food. So without further ado, um, let everybody, you know, clap in your own home and welcome Shaolin. Thank you, Japping, for the introduction. Um, hope everyone is nice and comfy in their own homes um, during this MCO. And um, yeah, I think Japping pretty much covered my background and how I start got started in this. Um, but I just wanted to take everyone through um, what Eat Shoots and Roots has been doing for the past eight years. We've been established since 2012. And um, like Japping said, when we started, we wanted to empower other urban folks like us with skills and tools to grow their own food as well. Um, this doesn't mean that we want to make sure that everyone can grow completely all their vegetables from their backyards, but it's to make sure that everyone at least knows how to grow their own food in case there was some sort of pandemic like this happening and, you know, and we had to actually stay home and, and be relegated to our spaces and, you know, I think having that knowledge of knowing how to grow something gives a bit of uh, a sense of security to all of us, especially to me. Um, so we've been doing this for eight years um, and over the years we've done so many different things. Um, you can actually find out more on our websites, on Instagram and Facebook, we've got tons of photos. But I'm just taking you through um, the next couple of slides in. and we're a really small team, so this is our team of Eat Shoots and Rooters. Uh, we're all working remotely at the moment. Um, I'm in the office, but everyone is spread out. And usually when we run our business, we actually um, run workshops and teach people how to grow from their homes. But because we can't do that right now, uh, we've been doing a lot of it online. We've been doing online site surveys, but also we've been 
um, really active on our online store because we find that a lot of people have been very interested suddenly in growing their own vegetables at home and we're happy that you know at least we are here to be able to serve uh, the community in supplying seeds and all that so the team's working hard behind the scenes um, but basically in our space we're based in Bukit Damansara at the moment uh, we just moved here two years ago um, we're focused on educating um, kids at the moment in our space we started out with educating adults and then we moved on into educating kids as well because we found that um, kids are the ones that you know are going to be taking care of the future evidently and they are the ones that need to know how to grow um, food from scratch and we find that a lot of other educational institutions don't um, focus on this very much so we partnered with Rimbon Montessori which is a sister company and Rimbon Montessori runs a daycare at our space and you can see from the photos that we've got compost base we've got vegetable beds um, Harbour later will take you through the idea of composting and I will be taking you through the idea of um, growing your own veggies but also within, within our space we also have some chickens um, like you can see on in the middle um, these two chickens are Kari and Kunyet our beloved chickens who gave us a lot of eggs so if you're starting a garden at home chickens are actually something that are well teacher, chickens are an element of your garden that can really contribute to it because you get eggs every day not a lot of people know this but if you have hens you can get eggs every day you don't need a male rooster to be able to have eggs some signs for you to um, find out more when you can google this at home so with the chickens, uh, we've got insects in our space as well. Um, that's all that's going on in our space. Um, we also run a lot of school holiday workshops. And when we run these workshops, it's to empower the children to, you know, at least learn how to plant, you know, vegetables. And then we take them through composting and we also take them through cooking their food. So in a way, it's easier to teach the children. For some reason, <laughs> they absorb knowledge, all this knowledge uh, quick quicker quicker than adults uh, but of course adults we have to do them one by one they can't come for a school holiday program so that's how we try to educate communities of different ages so now taking through everyone a couple of projects that we started um, from big to small so this was one of our biggest projects that we embarked with with Think City and it's based in YWCA in town and we were looking for a space in the city to start growing vegetables right because if you have a balcony you can grow some but you still need a large space to be able to grow a lot more and we wanted to experiment with this and we found a space in KL um, this is on Jalan Hang Jabat itself and uh, we worked with Think City to establish a really large garden this is about on a quarter of an acre space um, and it's in also partnership with YWCA. They have a vocational training opportunity center. We work with the culinary students who are girls from different underprivileged communities. They come and learn how to cook, but they also come and learn to garden at the same time. So with this garden, or should we say farm, which is the VTOC urban farm, um, the girls will learn how to cook. They have to grow vegetables and they're taken through a program of a full year together with our garden teacher, Clarice. And they learn from scratch, you know, how to grow it and how to cook it. And essentially, this is something that um, we feel that everyone should at least know. Um, but it's very, been very encouraging because, you know, we want people to be able to understand local vegetables. And if you ask uh, a lot of people in Malaysia what kind of vegetables they want to start growing, they will talk about carrots, potatoes broccoli but these are things that don't grow very easily in Malaysia and we want to push for things more like um, your laksa leaf, your gingers, your sweet potato leaf, these are things that grow much easier. Um, so with this garden it was established to educate everyone about that um, and you can actually find out more through a link later about what can grow in your backyard but this is just an example of how a large-scale garden can work. So with the next project um, that I wanted to highlight we also worked with developers before and it's become um, quite trendy, I would say, for people to get into edible gardening before this MCO. And a few years ago, we were approached by Gamuda Land to start a community garden for them. 
And if you understand residential development, usually what they would do is they have to strip the whole entire area of trees and then build everything from scratch. And so when we were brought in to build this Adam Garden, we had to deal with uh, a really barren piece of land, as you can see in this photo. Uh, but at the same time, Gabunda's employees were going to help us with this um, garden build as well. So we established this garden in the very hot sun, in, on very barren land. It kind of looks like a desert. And two years later, it looks like this. So the point of showing these slides are actually to say that it doesn't matter um, how barren your space is. You could be staying on uh, or in a terrace house or on a really in a really small apartment um, in a concreted space. You can still turn it into a garden. You can still grow something in your space. It's really not that hard. You just need to be a bit clever about it. So um, and learn more and do a lot of research and observe your space. So that was for a bit of inspiration. This is here also another piece of inspiration from one of the gardens that we built on a rooftop in Clearwater Building. Um, so this was done together with Jeff Ramsey. Jeff Ramsey is a Michelin star chef who runs the restaurant called Babe. And what he wanted to do was to build a garden on the rooftop so that he could grow these many different Japanese vegetables um, that he would use for his cooking, evidently. So we tried them out, we experimented. And whilst these vegetables, they grew well on our ground floor garden, when we, once we brought it up to the balcony or to the rooftop, um, they didn't fare very well. So this is something that everyone should take note is that when you're growing on a rooftop or a balcony, the climate can change drastically, even though it's like the second floor or third floor. And um, you may not be able to grow things that you pas you're passionately in love with eating. Uh, so you need to think about your local climate, what grows well in the tropical lowland climate. The climate here and the climate in Cameron Highlands is also very different. So a lot of vegetables that you see in the supermarket, you may think they grow in, uh, they grow locally, but they can't grow here in KL itself, where we are right now. If you're tuning in from elsewhere, then maybe from Cameron Highlands, you could be able to grow it. So with this rooftop, we built it using a no dig method. If you can see these tongs, they're called grow tongs. And when we brought them up, um, we just basically filled it with really good soil and started planting from there. And it's been thriving for a few years now. So down to more residential gardens, smaller gardens. This is an example of Cheryl Samad and her husband Pinko's garden, which we built um, using like wood that they were using from their past renovation. So this is something that you can do at home as well. If you have like unused materials, if it's not toxic and uh, leaching stuff or chem bad, really bad chemicals, you can use it to build your garden beds. So here we established a very simple garden bed. We started growing a lot of local veg vegetables. Behind them, you can see it's a forest of Ulam Raja. Ulam Raja is an amazing plant because it tastes like rocket, but it grows way better than rocket here in Malaysia. So that's something that you can try at home, um, but very easy to establish simple gardens at home. Of course, not everybody is um, living on uh, landed property. This is an example of another garden that we built for Dian Li. Uh, and this was also established um, next to her house. She's got a concrete space and we established these grow tongs on top of it as well. And it's been doing really well. And um, a lot of questions that we have is also about how to establish a vertical garden. People always see all these pictures on Pinterest and they're like, oh, I want to do this vertical garden because, you know, it looks so pretty and all that. But vertical gardens are actually quite tricky to manage because then you have to think about irrigation. You need to think about sunlight when you're growing edible vegetables. So for us, every time people ask us um, to build a vertical garden, we always suggest to build a trellis so that your plants can climb up and then become vertical automatically. Um, and it's really easy because the, they do the work themselves. The plants just climb up. And there are plenty of plants that you know need a trellis. For instance, your beans, um, your bunga telang, even your sengkuang, they need climbers. So things like that, um, you can start looking online to see what you can grow and establish as climbers, just to build a very easy um, vertical garden. So this is the last uh, showcase garden that I want to show. This is on a terrace house. And with Samantha, we established just one garden bed. If you can see behind baby Ryan, who's not so baby anymore, uh, we 
fish one garden bed and they have harvested so much from it. Um, if you look on the next slide, Samantha has been really creative with the stuff that she has been growing. Um, and she makes really interesting things like chalmushi with, uh, with a bit of uh, lime leaf. And then you can also see the limapuro and the cheese body that she's been harvesting. And with Thai basil, something that you normally cook with chicken or your basil chicken, right? She placed it on her cake. So, you know, you can be really, really creative with the kind of things that you grow. And you don't have to be so relegated to how it's typically cooked and prepared. Um, because now's the time to be really creative now that everyone's at home, right? And cooking so much. Uh, so... I wanted to, I have like maybe eight minutes left and I just wanted to bring you through the gardening process. When you start a garden, it's not just buying soil, chucking seeds and then wishing for the best and hoping that your plants are going to grow well and, you know, thinking that Mother Nature is going to take care of it. There's actually quite a bit of work behind it and I'm just going to take you through the steps. So first of all, you really need to make sure that you have enough sunlight and this is an example of a garden that we established on a balcony. Uh, I wouldn't recommend growing on a balcony if it doesn't have access to sunlight like this because you just see that your plants won't be very happy, they'll be very sad, they'll be locked over to the side, you know. So sunlight is really important, especially for edible plants. So you need to make sure you have enough sunlight. And then you get your seeds, you start planning and thinking about what you like to eat. And then only you get your soil. When you're getting soil, you need to make sure that you get good soil as well. You can't just get uh, simple clay and then expect your vegetables to grow well. Plants also need to eat and make their own food. So soil is very important. It's the foundation and Harbour will take you through it later on how soil is very important. So what I've done here in my own home is that I used old um, cutlery. I use them as name tags. I wrote the names on it and I filled in my containers. This is a planter box that we use at ESR and I started planting and this was on the 4th of April. Okay, So on the 4th of April, I planted um, a few different things and because I stay in a balcony, uh, in a balcony, in an apartment with a, actually not even a balcony, uh, an area for washing, I just have a really sad uh, grill that is my exposure to the sun. So actually, you can make use of your grill and hang your plants on it. So that is what I did. Hung my plants on the balcony grill. And my rocket's been growing really well since. And I've been putting them on my dishes every day. And people are getting a bit sick of my rocket microgreens. But um, it's been really useful. And you can do this with so many other things. And this is an example of how it looks like. You start growing your seed on the left. And within two, three days, actually, you'll start rooting already, depending on the kind of plant. This was rocket, right? And then after that, the third picture you can see, it looks really cute. Plants start growing, you know. It's actually really amazing how, how things can just form a bit of a miracle of life. Um, so that's how you can start with seeds and soil. This is an example of a product that we have called the Seed Box. If you want to start easily, we also have this in our store. Um, it comes with little peat pellets that you add water and then when it sort of expands, you can start planting your seeds in it and then you can transplant this instead. So this is more for people who don't have access to soil for the time being. You use this and then later on in two weeks, you still need to transplant it into soil. So uh, this, these are also pictures of my curly dwarf pak choy that I started just last week. It's growing really well, an example, and it's pretty cool looking. So once you've established what you want to grow, you got your seeds, you got your soil, you need to make sure that you have enough planter trays or planter boxes and things like that. So you can technically grow in any kind of tray that you want and have, as long as it's not a toxic material that can leach into your plants or into the soil. So here, what we have is something we use for our microgreens. Um, this is red amaranth and radish at the back. We grow this for the babies. So after two weeks, we harvest all of it. We put it on our meals as a garnish. This is also an example that I used earlier, which is a very simple baking tin almost um, that we use for planting herbs. Um, if you have something that has holes, then you can leave it outside. But if you're on your balcony and you don't want your balcony to get dirty, you can leave it without holes, but you need to make sure that your watering is not so crazy because otherwise then your pots are going to get flooded. And this is another example of a planter edge that we have um, which is used, which we use fiber cement to make. 
And with this, we like it because it looks like wood. But then if you use wood in your garden, it's going to break down really fast and really easily. So this is something that we use instead, fiber cement planks. Which you can find in our shop if you need to, if you need to establish something. So the last two parts are actually uh, feed and care. So when you have already established your garden, you really need to make sure that you feed your garden well. And I think Harbier can take you through a very intensive course on composting and you know how fertilizer works in your garden later. What we have in store is mainly just compost and goat poo. Goat poo is really nice because it's very neat. It comes in pellets, it doesn't smell, so this is something that we've been stocking as well. But you can also use things like chicken manure, cow dung is amazing, bat dung, try to look at different kinds of manures that you can fertilize your garden with. And you need to make sure that your garden is fed at least once every two weeks or every once a week. Because if you go to a nursery, you realize the plants are doing really well. And they do well because they are fed with decent amount of fertilizer all the time. So microbes is also something that you might want to look into because microbes in the soil can also help your plants to be able to absorb nutrients better. So nutrients is something that we have in stock. You can also look into garbage enzymes. There are a lot of homemade um, solutions that you can find as well. This is just these are just items that we have in store to make it easy for people to stock up on. Um, but you can look up on it later. Um, and lastly, of course, pest control. I put a picture of pumpkin bugs uh, mating here because, you know, it's kind of strange that once you get pumpkins, you attract a certain kind of bug. But when you don't have pumpkins, they don't come. So here what we have is we have uh, natural solutions that you can also make yourself. What we use is we use neem, which is a very bitter leaf. And when we spray it on the leaves, it makes it very bitter as well and repels all the pests. So that's something that you can look into. But if you don't want to buy neem or if you don't want to make your own or if you don't have access to it, the best thing you can do is just use water to spray the bugs off and use your bare hands. Very gross, but very, very useful as well. It's okay for you to do it as a gardener. It's just very hard for the farmer to do it because then the farmer has acres and acres of land. So that's uh, how they have to manage it. This is a picture of how my microgreens have been harvested. I put it on my chicken curry. So that's how you can um, eat your greens very easily. So I'm down to my last minute. So I just wanted to share a few resources that we have had. And you can look up sireinthecity.com. It has a listing of plants that you can grow very well in uh, the lowland, the tropical lowlands of KL. Here we've highlighted sweet potato, mint, brinjols, um, but you can grow plenty of things. Um, check out our videos on YouTube, very useful. We've done this uh, together at Think City ages ago, so now is the best time to bring it up again. And lastly, we also have a shop. If anyone needs to buy things right now, uh, we've been having quite a few requests over the past month on gardening supplies, so we've been very lucky that we have an online store running. If you need anything, feel free to get in touch. Um, we have a hotline or get in touch with us via email, WhatsApp, that's pretty much it, really. So thank you so much, Think City, for allowing me to speak for my 20 minutes. I'll pass it back to Japping, if Japping is going to come back on. Hi, thank you so much, Charlene. And do stay with us, because at the end of our session, we will be conducting a Q&A. So I'll, I'll see you then. OK. So um, I've already seen some people writing some questions. Uh, if you could just keep them coming, uh, we have an offline um, question picker who is also compiling the questions for us. Until then, I'd like to um, go to our next speaker, um, Haber Gill. So Haber, uh, what can I say? He is, you know, unique and um, he's just one of kind. He has been an urban edible garden enthusiast for the past 15 years. Um, he's been running workshops and sharing his knowledge on composting, uh, soil management and home cultivation for the past nine years. Habir is especially passionate um, about the state of soil in our urban spaces. He believes that if everyone built a compost heap, the world would be a much better place. So today, Habir runs and manages ground control and ground control was set up to help Malaysians enjoy the pleasures and benefits of gardening. So, you know, over to you, Habir. Thank you very much, Japing. Thanks, Shaolin. Um, good uh, um, afternoon, everybody. Um, it's about to rain really heavily here in PJ, so I hope I don't get cut out. Um, ground control 
sits in a very similar space to um, Eat Shoots and Roots. Um, we've, I've actually been um, involved with the gardening space about the same time as Eat Shoots and Roots have been around. We have collaborated and worked together in many, many projects. Um, and I'm going to concentrate on one particular part of uh, the gardening scene that um, we seem to have um, grown into. So we, we do very similar things in terms of like we set up edible gardens. This is a project that we actually did with Eat Shoots and Roots. Um, the metal bins that you see, they're called grow tongs. It's something that we brought into the market about uh, 10 years ago now. And um, they've, they um, are lightweight uh, planters um, that are durable and, and work well um, in, in our climate. Um, and the other thing that we do is we do education and stuff like that. Um, but the one part aspect of gardening and home gardening that we seem to have concentrated on and um, have built um, a business more about is, is soils. And, and more importantly, uh, composting. So today I'm going to concentrate and talk to you about how you can compost at home and, and why you should compost. Uh, while I was preparing for this uh, webinar today, I reached out to a few people, some friends, some people who previously asked me about composting. Uh, shout out to Jeremy and Alicia, who I kind of referred to and I said, you know, what is it that you would like to know uh, about about um, soil and composting. So I've tried to um, answer a few questions, but please keep the questions coming as well later on. Um, now, one of the things I've noticed in uh, the last few weeks of this MCO, I'm so, so encouraged. Uh, one of the positives, I guess, that's come out of the MCO is that more and more people are beginning to understand that we need to pay more attention in urban centers to sustainable food systems, look at ways that we can set up edible gardens, edible, um, uh, I, there was a webinar a couple of days ago on this platform um, where a gentleman was talking about how we need to increase um, uh, community gardens, not just for people to have access to food, but also for um, uh, mind, you know, peace of mind, uh, give people some relaxation, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we need to, if we are to do this, if we are to increase and build more gardens and urban spaces, if we are to get more, well, we're going to need more and more of a resource. And that resource is soil. We need far better soil than we have um, in Malaysia. In our urban settings, we need far better compost. Uh, and so today I'm going to try and talk about, about that. This is another visual that a project that we worked with things uh, with um, each roots and roots, sorry. Uh, and it's a community garden that's been set up for a, a school. Um, and the, the abundance that is available and can grow in these community gardens, they thrive because of good soil. If we don't have good soil, if we don't have good compost within our soils, then the, the gardens themselves are going to suffer. So today I've broken up the talk into two parts. Firstly, we're going to discuss about why we uh, need to compost and bring it back perhaps to look at um, the reason why we're doing this Earth Day, Earth Week webinars, which is bring it back to the topic of, um, of climate change. And the second part of this will be about, I'm going to try and teach you how to compost at home, and then we can, um, then we can take some questions at the end. Uh, but before we do that, um, I'd like to uh, play a video. If you're like most people, you're probably feeling a little hopeless about climate change and the damage we've done to our planet. Well, now there's a new way to look at climate change and how to deal with it that might just turn that hopelessness into hope. Climate change, as we know, is all about too much carbon in our atmosphere. But carbon is not our enemy. It's the building block of life. Everything alive is made of it, even us. The problem and the solution are simply a matter of balance. Let's step back and look at the five pools where carbon is stored on planet Earth. 
Starting about 500 million years ago, when plants first appeared on land, carbon began to cycle in an amazing balance between these pools, a balance that allowed for life as we know it to evolve. Then one life form, that would be us, figured out how to extract carbon from the fossil pool, which was pretty much a timeout zone for carbon. We've been burning it for energy, putting into play, and disrupting that balance. The way we manage land and do agriculture is moving even more carbon into the atmosphere. Specifically, we've moved 880 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which is heating up the planet and destabilizing our climate. The oceans have absorbed a lot of this excess carbon, throwing off the ocean's balance, resulting in ocean acidification and accelerating a mass extinction of sea life. So in order to save life as we know it, of course we need to stop burning fossil carbon. The big question is, where do we put this excess carbon to get the cycle back in balance? The good news is that the answer is literally right under our feet. It's the soil. Plants, using sunlight and water, naturally perform photosynthesis. They pull carbon in from the air and turn it into carbohydrates, sugars. Then they pump some of these sugars down through the roots to feed microorganisms who use that carbon to build healthy soil. Voila, carbon moved. The plants pump it in and the soil stores it. Nature's living technology is amazing. Scientists have recently discovered that applying a thin layer of compost can help regenerate healthy soil, setting up an ongoing feedback loop that brings more and more carbon into the soil each year. Together with other regenerative practices, like not tilling the soil, planting trees and cover crops, and planned grazing, we can build and retain billions of tons of soil carbon. This is carbon farming. This is regenerative agriculture. Unlike more carbon in the atmosphere, more carbon in the ground is good for us. It makes healthy soil, which is nutrient rich and full of life and holds way more water. This means more nutritious food and crops that are more resilient in the face of drought. That's good news for farmers, families, and everyone who eats. Remember this, the way we grow our food, fiber, and fuel either puts carbon up into our atmosphere or pulls it down into the ground. The regeneration of soil is the task of our generation. Our health, the health of our soils, and the health of our planet are one and the same. That's a, that's a really simple um, video that I, I um, absolutely love. Um, I was asked today, one of the questions that I put out to people, what do you want to know is, is that, you know, why should I compost? Um, I've been saying this for a long time. I think that composting is the greenest thing that we can do in Malaysia today. And uh, if we want to make a difference uh, in, in terms of climate change and stuff, yes, everyone thinks of the big, big pictures, which is energy, um, burning um, greenhouse, uh, sorry, burning fossil fuels, et cetera, et cetera. But compost is something that we can all take part in um, on a daily basis and see the effects of um, long term. All of us at home, it doesn't matter what strata of society you come from, it doesn't matter uh, where you live, whether you live in a small house or a big house, whatever, we all cook. And we all generate a considerable amount of food waste. Um, these are just clippings from, um, from a meal that we cooked uh, the other day. And everybody has a little bit of this from their kitchens regularly. If you look at bigger, bigger, hotels, if you start looking at um, hospitals, various big commercial projects, you get more and more and more of this waste. Currently, in Malaysia, we produce 38,000 tons of waste daily. 95% of that waste goes to landfill. 50% of that waste is potentially compostable. Now, if you break it down, a lot of that uh, food, a lot of that compostable waste is 
food scraps, um, where it comes from kitchens or also food that's wasted in markets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then there's other factors within um, uh, that that people kind of ignore. You know, paper, paperboard, cardboard is all compostable. All your all the trimmings from your gardens, they're all compostable. And um, other wood materials, you know, you can compost um, old pallets, for instance. You know, we try and recycle them, upcycle them. But so much of that stuff just gets end, end up in landfill when it can be turned into compost. Um, I'm going to go back slightly. Now, now, the big, big problem with sending materials to landfill is essentially that this waste goes to landfill and it, it produces, um, after periods of time, um, a methane gas. Now, methane gas is far, far worse for the environment than CO2. Um, and then later on down, you get horrible leachates um, and substances that leak into, um, into our waterways, etc., etc. If we can prevent all of these materials from going to landfill and convert them into compost, we will be doing a massive, massive uh, favor for the environment and the effects of climate change for Malaysia. Um, now, the, the United Nations um, has already basically started to declare that the fertility of soils and how we and how we add nutrients and compost into the soils can affect climate change. But it is free nutrients that we can put back into our soils and it is desperately, desperately needed to improve biodiversity within the soils, etc., etc. And in Malaysia, this is even more so of a concern. Um, to describe um, a rainforest, the reason a rainforest is so, so fertile and healthy is because it produces, on a daily basis, its own compost. It produces its own compost, its own food, the soil is healthy, and it thrives. When we start cutting down our forests, as we need to, some cases for development and stuff, what we, um, what we do is we create a huge amount of erosion on that good quality soil, and we are left with a very, very, very bad quality soil. A lot of people who have tried to grow or grow in gardens um, in the Klang Valley and also in the new developments, what they discover is, is that the soil is um, rock hard, it's very clay, etc. And, and that is because the top layer of compost, of, of nutri um, nutrient-rich soil has, has eroded away. More so, when we try and buy soils these days um, in Malaysia and we try and buy topsoils, what we're getting is is um, this is a, a, a visual of a, of a new development where this was has been laid down as topsoil. Um, it's essentially laterite clay. You're not really going to be able to grow very much um, in it unless you use lots of chemical fertilizer. Uh, so reason why do we need compost? The simple reason is, is that we want to grow, if we want to produce more and more um, gardens uh, for um, for PPR flats, for communities, uh, for our own homes. Um, we need to increase the amount of compost that we produce and we need to make compost cheaper so that more and more people have access to it um, and we can get it into our, our gardens and our, uh, and our pots, etc. Uh, I'm very pleased to say, like, organizations like Eat Shoots and Roots and stuff, the reason they have such success um, with their planting and stuff is, is because they, they use ground controls, compost and soils. Um, and we've worked with them from day one to ensure that we get good soils and good compost into people's hands. So as the video showed, to to change the effects of climate change when it comes to soil and comp compost is just an easy, easy answer. That is a very low hanging fruit that we really need to start taking more advantage of in Malaysia than we do. Okay, now I'm gonna move on to the second part, which is um, how to compost at home, because everybody seems to ask me how, 
um, to compost at home. I would like to put out a poll question um, for this. Um, if you click on the side, I think there's um, a poll. And um, very simply, uh, how many of you have tried composting? Uh, never tried and, get, and given up. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that uh, in a little bit later. And I'm sure you can have lots and lots of questions about this later on because um, everyone always has questions. There's not a day that goes by that my WhatsApp doesn't have questions about how to compost or why to compost or why my compost doesn't work. Okay, I'm going to get straight to it, keep it very, very simple. To make compost, people seem to overcomplicate it. To make compost, you need four simple things. You need carbon, you need nitrogen, you need water, and you need air. Um, I will get into what carbon is and what nitrogen and water is. Um, sorry, um, why you need water and why you need air in a second. But I put carbon on the top. This is probably the one um, element that people tend to miss out uh, the most or, or put the li least emphasis on when they're doing composting and it's the one that you need to probably put the most emphasis on. Um, carbon or browns. In Malaysia, there is only one place you really, really need to go if you're composting at home um, to look for your source of carbon. And that is leaves, dried leaves. And we are absolutely amazing um, at sweeping up leaves and leaving them in bags all over our towns and our cities. You do not need to go very, very far, even during this MCO period, I know we're not allowed out, but the, the guys who sweep our roads, the excellent people who've been, they've done an amazing job on our, my street, for instance, of, of keeping the streets clean. And what we do, whether you be in apartment blocks, whether you be in landed property, um, <clears throat> uh, wherever you go, we love, 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 love to sweep up leaves, put them in bags and leave them on the side of the road. 98% of this time, these leaves are going to landfill. This is an amazing, great source of carbon that you can be using for your compost. If I go back to other sources of carbon, um, cardboard, paper, um, um, we don't use too many dryers in Malaysia, but dryer lint, um, straw, uh, wood chips, all these are amazing, amazing sources of carbon that generally are ending up uh, in, in landfill. So, nitrogen. Nitrogen is the easiest thing for us to, to find um, if you're thinking of composting at home, certainly. You don't need to look any further than your kitchens. All the waste that you generate on a daily basis from the waste that you, you when you're processing food to cook, um, coffee grounds, your vegetable peelings, um, eggshells, uh, tea bags, you need to be a little bit careful with tea bags because sometimes the, the bags themselves are made out of a plastic. Um, hair, um, if you have pets, pet hair, all can be composted and be used as nitrogen. Um, there's a whole host of other things if you're doing composting commercially or in an agricultural settings, you can start using dung, goat dung, um, um, cow dung, etc. But don't need to look any further than your kitchen for composting. I'll get to what you should not use for composting um, a bit later on, but yeah. Okay, so carbon, nitrogen, water, and air. You need water because compost is a living thing. It's alive. You need to keep it alive. And um, you need to put air through it. Uh, because you, you, you want to make compost fast. The difference between a rainforest floor, which produces compost in its own sweet time, um, and the way we make compost, or we would like to make compost in our homes, is we can turn the compost to get air through it. Um, and this speeds up the process and the time frame in which you can make compost. I have a visual here of um, um, a, a somebody who's, who's created a compost, pile um, and that when it comes to composting and how and the, the way you compost and what you use to compost, size certainly does matter. Um, 
if you have a large space and a large garden, you should try and make the compost as big as you can. You should also start trying to utilize all the scraps you have from your garden, etc. the leaves, um, the trimmings, if you have big branches, try and cut them down to smaller pieces. Okay, there is a very big problem with this image and the reason I have it up is, is that if you see the, the, the pile on the right hand side, um, it is covered in leafy greens. You must never, ever, ever leave a compost pile um, with the nitrogen, with the leafy greens on top. Okay, please, every time you build a compost pile, you build it in layers. So you start with your carbon, you put your nitrogen in, and you must, must, must cover it with carbon, otherwise you will start getting bugs and flies. The ratio to carbon to nitrogen, a very, very simple rule is if you take a handful of nitrogen waste from your kitchen, please put in three handfuls of dried leaves. Okay, depending on how wet your the nitrogen content is from your kitchen, you must then sprinkle some water over it. Do you need to cover a compost pile? If you leave a compost pile open um, uh, uh, in our climates like Malaysia, it is going to perfectly happily break down without much um, uh, issue. I was asked, one of the questions I got asked today is, is that, does it make a difference um, composting here as opposed to composting in, in you know, um, um, European colder climates? Yes. The benefits that we have in Malaysia to composting is far, far greater. Our climate is perfect for things breaking down to become compost. So the larger the space you have, please try and make them, utilize it and try and get a pile as big as possible. However, not everyone is lucky to have a big garden. So you need to start looking at solutions where you can compost in smaller areas. This is a bin that you can turn. It helps with the turning because you can rotate the bin. Um, but even composting in a small bin like this, even though it's slightly harder, is, is absolutely possible. I was sent this picture this morning by um, somebody who's trying to compost, and they asked me, they said, uh, H, I've got a big problem with my compost. I've opened it this morning and I have bugs um, and I have a few maggots in it. Um, yes, the simple reason that this visual you can see where the maggots are is they broke the rule that I was talking about earlier. They put their nitrogen into the compost, but they did not cover it with carbon. If you, If they had left the carbon on top, straight after putting the nitrogen on, you will not get bugs and you will not um, uh, get smells because... Hello? Sorry, you have one minute to sum oh, up. Thank okay. You. Right, so, so um, very quickly to wrap it up, one of the things that uh, I do not recommend composting, if you want to compost in an urban uh, setting, whether it be an apartment, whether it be uh, in a house, etc., etc., in a uh, is please do not put in any dairy, any fish, any meat, uh, any bones, um, and any cat or dog litter into your compost because you do not want to attract any kind of um, uh, bad pathogens or, more importantly, rodents or pests. If you keep it to vegetable organic matter. You will not have an issue with your compost if you put enough carbon in your compost. Keep your compost rich in carbon, a um, little bit of nitrogen, and, I, and you should have um, success. There's lots of really good videos um, online, but I really, really think that please, please, please go ahead and give composting a, a chance. Okay? Get out and compost. Thank you very much. So thank you so much, um, Haber, for that. I think it was very informative. We've got tons of questions. So may I just invite 
Shaolin back uh, in the panel, and we can start to basically shoot off some questions. So the first few questions, there are quite a lot, so I'm going to summarize some of them, uh, is for Shaolin. Um, a lot to do with planting on balconies. Um, how do you do that um, in, in terms of rotation of soil? Um, also, what are the best ulams to plant? What are the quickest ones to plant? And um, yeah, so, and what do you do with pests? Is there a site for us to help deal with our pests? Okay, so for rotation of soil, usually um, it's practiced in farms because they have large pieces of land and they're growing one thing at a time. But actually, if you're growing on your balcony, it's not really necessary to practice crop rotation. Um, you will notice that things start to not do so well after a while. You probably get sick of growing the same vegetable after a while as well. So you would kind of naturally rotate. Um, but with balcony gardening, what you need to do is you have to make sure that you have enough compost so you replenish the soils because when it rains, um, nutrients get washed off, nutrients will run off. So it's important to replenish your soils using compost or fertilizer. And sometimes people ask whether they can reuse their soil. You can reuse it, but you need to add more things to it because it washes away after a while. Um, so before we... Oh, sorry. Go on. Uh, sorry, just going on to pests, is it? Yes. Yeah, so for pests, um, the best way is actually to manually just remove the pest if you see it with your hands. It's the most organic uh, way to do it. Uh, or if you have a sprayer thing, you just spritz it off. Only if that doesn't work, then you can try to look into getting a neem spray or you can make your own chili garlic spray. These things sort of like coat a layer of bitterness or spiciness to your plants so that when bugs come, they're repelled by it. Yeah. So you also mentioned that you can use a whole host of manure or, um, as fertilizer. So we have one um, question about dog poo. Yeah, so people always ask about dog poo. So like Harbour is shaking his head right now. The, the reasoning behind dog poo is that um, this is somebody, what somebody else said. Like I haven't done the science behind it, right? I haven't been in a lab testing out dog poo. Um, but the science behind it is that dogs eat uh, food that's very similar to humans, so then the chances of pathogens crossing over is a bit higher. That's what I read before. I can't like say that it's scientifically proven, um, but in general, yeah, I would just yeah. avoid it anyway. You can compost dog poo, but you would have to do it in a completely separate um, system. Um, so that's another session altogether. A bit like humor compost, which is yeah another comp session altogether, because um, yeah, um, okay. you can of, of course compost um, um, human waste as well, but you know, yeah, let's not go there. <laughs> okay, so while well, we've got you um, on, Haber, uh, a lot of people say, do we need a planting bed or can we plant straight on the ground? Um, how do we, you know, how can we, you know, uh, yeah, so that's, that's it. Are all composts equal? It's, it's also another question. Sorry? Are all composts equal? No, and can all composts plant directly to the ground? Um, I, 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 um, you have compost that are, um, if you're doing compost right, if you have more woody material in, in certain compost, you're going to get a compost which is more rich in fungal um, microbes and then another one which has got more uh, bacterial uh, in it, more bacterial microbes. So, so uh, we produce compost commercially and we do produce two separate types of compost. We produce one compost which is very, very... Um, woody and another compost which is very bacterial rich but look at home please 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 start putting more the biggest problem I notice when I have to go around and I get phone calls about compost is, is that people do not put enough carbon into their compost don't be scared to put a handful of extra leaves if you have access to wood chips stick a little bit extra in it helps with the breaking down it helps with the smell and it really helps with the quality of the compost that you have at the end. Yeah, um, yeah. there yeah. are so many different ways of breaking organic matter down. Vermi compost is one of them, Bukashi is one of them. All of them are great, right? right. But uh, the reason I encourage people to do traditional style of composting is because we need more soil, good quality compost to put into our soils um, uh, because they're eroding away with the kind of rain that we have now. You need to keep replenishing them. 
Right. Okay. So uh, there's a quick question. Thank you. Um, there's a quick question about uh, how do we know what is suitable soil? I mean, you know, there are the ones that um, Shaolin uh, posted a picture of like totally clay, you know, a uh, light brown. And I think that needs a topsoil. But how do we know if we've got a, a garden that already grows grass, um, that it's good soil or bad soil? How, what is the test? Well, um, you can uh, dig down and take the soil and if you put it in, in um, uh, water, uh, a jar of water and give it a really good thorough shake mm -hmm. um, and you let it sit for a few hours, what you do is you the, the soil, the sediments in the soil will break down and you will see what percentage mm -hmm. of clay, what percentage of sand and what percentage of um, organic matter you have within the soil. Um, that's a simple way of, um, of um, doing a test. Um, uh, but, but yeah, I, 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 as in um, soils, uh, you do need clay. I mean, like trees need clay, right? Otherwise, they would fall over. You can't grow a tree in pure compost, for instance, or a bigger plant. Mm -hmm. So when you look at soil, um, when we talk about quality of soil, we don't just look at uh, nutrients. We look at the chemistry, we look at the biology, but also the physics. Um, so when we produce our soil blends, we also produce some blends that have got clay in it. Um, yeah, so, so right. yeah. Okay, so and where do they find out more about these things? Are there websites that you can recommend for them to go to? Uh, one for planting, Shalim, and the other one for soil? Well, it's endless. So what do they type? Like, you know, what's the ten top one Google question that you can use that will bring up the top three sites that you like? Okay, so for me, right, my favorite site is actually Malaysia Gardeners Facebook group. So if you have questions, because it's a group of, I don't know, 20,000, 40,000 people right now. I can't remember the last count. If you have any questions, you can search into questions that people have asked before. And a lot of local gardeners have already answered those questions. So it's very good that you get different viewpoints on it. Um, if you need, uh, people ask what kind of things can grow in Malaysia. We did the Think City website uh, called Sayo in the City years ago. It's still up. So that's kind of like a good gauge to see what can grow in KL. Um, mm. that's for that yeah. love. And then of course our online shop, which you can look for materials, including H yeah. soil. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So one last question. Um, I think we have one to say that, you know, you've, um, divided it into dry carbon. Um, so what do you do with all your meats and your bones? Ah, uh, so, um, you can, uh, do Bukashi composting. Um, but, um, again, you have to be very, very careful with um, meats and bones. And the main reason is, is that if you, if you, um, that's where, number one, you're going to attract squirrels, rats, um, other vermin, cats, all sorts of stuff. So if you, if you try to avoid that, um, for now, there, there aren't credible uh, urban um, solutions. Uh, then that I can think of. I mean, one way is is black soldier fly larvae. People are, are beginning to set up uh, black soldier fly larvae plants, and and they would certainly eat through meat and fish and and dairy products. And the other one to avoid is actually oily foods. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, try not to um, uh, uh, um, throw throw too many oily foods because that seems to attract um, vermin as well. Okay. Um, so I think that a lot of people are saying, how can I get you to come and speak at our schools, at our communities? Um, how do they get hold of you? Um, H-A-R-B-I-R <laughs> at groundcontrol.my. Right. And Charlie? Yeah, for us, you can just go to our website, eatsshootsandroots.com, our Instagram, Facebook, uh, shop website, www. Yeah. We're also on... Uh, ground control, P O T M Y, on Facebook. So yeah, so okay. yeah. And I think that um, some of your ESR people have been posting places to go. So um, for the uh, attendees um, coming into this webinar, if you just scroll down the chat, there's already people telling you where to go. Um, unfortunately, we don't have much time. We've run out of time. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Haber. I think it's been invaluable. Thank you, Shaolin. Um, I think a lot of people are amazed at the amount of, um, you know, the, the proliferation of 
vegetables that you manage to grow. Um, you know, so I, I just hope that after this, there'll be much more gardeners um, mushrooming up, pun intended. Um, and uh, yeah, I look forward to catching up with you again. So thank you so much.